See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. Hey, See You Now listeners. As we move into March, dive into Women's History Month and join the world in celebrating International Women's Day, it's a perfect moment to listen again to our Nurses You Should Know episode. While not all nurses are women, historically and currently, women represent at a global level about 90% of the nursing workforce. And those nurses, past and present, have made significant contributions to the health of society, their communities, and the nursing profession. Embrace Equity is the 2023 theme for International Women's Day pursuing a world where difference is valued and celebrated. And the Nurses You Should Know project does just that. Before we roll into the episode, we did a quick check-in with Joanna Seltzer Uribe and Raven Aponte, the creators and energy behind Nurses You Should Know, for an update. Hi, guys. Hi. Good to talk with you guys again. So, uh, Nurses You Should Know, we're going into March and you're right at that cusp between Black History Month and Women's History Month. And this is like if you needed a place to go <laughs> to find a lot of stories, Nurses You Should Know is a great archive. Have you seen different groups come to this resource and find parts of the stories that weren't told or were erased? For us to really look at the way that different people came into nursing at different eras is honestly very humbling because you can actually see how different voices and different cultures come together to shape the profession and what they've done to make it a more integrative, more inclusive space since the profession started. In terms of the history months, it's like, oh, I finally see myself in this public facing project. It's a reaffirming project. And it shows me that I matter and I'm making an impact in nursing. So often nurses are, you're in your niche and you feel like you are kind of just chipping away <laughs> and chipping away. And you don't often see what doors you're opening for others. And you don't often see the impact that you're really having on this longer, larger level. And so I think that's really what the stories help to impart is to keep chipping away <laughs> because really all of the things that you chip away at in the end, you actually see the impact that they had. As we listen again to Nurses You Should Know, those who have fought for diversity, for inclusion and belonging, and for better healthcare for everyone, we're inspired and we're hopeful. Enjoy the show. There is so much of our profession and the healthcare of our nation that is intertwined with these historical periods that in aggregate give us the outcomes that we're seeing today. These issues are complex. There's a lot of things interacting. There's a lot of people and institutions and ideas at play. A lot of what we have uncovered across all of our stories has really been this piece of social innovation. You have these organizations across the nation and they're addressing these issues of Black health disparities in our communities. How do we deliver care to our communities who are excluded from the hospitals and clinics because they're Black? How do we increase opportunities for Black nurses and Black doctors to train? Social innovation as the process of developing and deploying effective solutions to challenge systemic social issues is embedded into who we are as a profession. That history is still alive today. Welcome to See You Now. I'm Shauna Butler. In 1976, when the United States marked its bicentennial, Congress designated February as Black History Month, a heritage month designed to surface, celebrate, and honor 
the legacy, achievements, and contributions of African Americans, and nurses and their contributions have been among those to be honored. The nursing profession began to change when Mary Eliza Mahoney, celebrated as the first Black nurse in U.S. history, graduated from the New England Hospital for Women and Children Nursing Program in 1879 and earned a professional nursing license. While many African Americans served as nurses before her, Mahoney's success opened doors for future generations of Black women in nursing, and she would devote the rest of her career to making the profession more accessible to all. She championed increased access to nursing education and fought against discrimination in the profession throughout her career, supporting the creation of the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses in 1908. The history of Black nurses in America had been marked by a struggle for access, access to education, to licensure, to career growth, to fair, equitable, and respectful treatment, and most fundamentally, to inclusion and having their contributions acknowledged, elevated, and written into the history and identity of nursing. As we come to the close of Black History Month and roll into Women's History Month, in this episode, we meet two nurse innovators on a quest to introduce you in fun and sticky ways to nurses you should know, and more importantly, why we should know them. Known as the first Black public health nurse, Jessie Sleet Scales was a graduate of Chicago's Providence School of Nursing in 1895. Nurse Frances Alrier, a civil rights activist in California. She was also a Black Cross nurse, which was a part of Marcus Garvey's UNIA organization. Lula Oil Bloin was the first Eastern Band Cherokee Indian registered nurse. She went to Washington, D.C. and advocated to make sure that there was a hospital at the Kuala Boundary in Appalachia on her reservation. Nurse Mary Elizabeth Carnegie pushed to highlight the contributions of Black nurses. She also authored The Paths We Tread, Blacks in Nursing Worldwide, which is one of the first collections of all of the contributions that Black nurses contributed to nursing and how they helped shape the nursing we know today. Nella Larson attended the Lincoln School for Nurses in the Bronx and graduated in 1915 and became a head nurse at the Tuskegee Institute at Alabama. Her whole career overlapped with the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic in which she left nursing and she pivoted into becoming a librarian. She became a writer. She wrote in children's magazines and she ended up writing two novels and eventually ended up going back to nursing. If anyone has seen the Netflix film Passing that came out recently, Nella Larson wrote that book. I don't think people would typically associate the contributions of a nurse to the Harlem Renaissance and to all of the writers coming out of that era. Hi, I'm Joanna Seltzer Uribe. I am a co-creator of the Nurses You Should Know project. I am a nurse informaticist and a design thinking lead who has taught one of the first design thinking courses to graduate and undergraduate nurses in the country. And I currently work as a clinical nurse informaticist at the only female-owned hospital in the state of New Jersey. I'm Raven Aponte, co-creator of Nurses You Should Know. I'm a second-degree nurse, historian, Black woman. My first degree is in African-American studies and health disparities. My clinical background is in pediatric intensive care unit. So I started on a pediatric cardiac intensive care unit as a new grad nurse. I've also served as a clinical instructor for nursing students in pediatric care. And with Nurses You Should Know, as a co-creator, this is a project meant to highlight the contributions of nurses of color. So Black nurses, Hispanic nurses, Asian American nurses, Pacific Islander nurses, Indigenous nurses, and just meant to highlight the contributions that they have made to nursing and how they have helped shape nursing. (laughs) 
I once heard a very wise nurse philosopher say, everyone and everything has an origin story. Origin stories create the basis of collective memory, which in turn creates the elements of our identity and who we believe ourselves to be. And that wise nurse philosopher who I heard say that, and it really resonated with me, Joanna, was you talking about the origin stories of the nursing profession. And so I was curious if you could share the origin story of the project, Nurses You Should Know. Nurses You Should Know is an online micro learning platform that is designed to intentionally center the contribution of nurses of color and expand our nursing narrative. The origin of the project started during some early doctoral work. I was doing some early research looking at the evolution of nursing education, and I was deep into a 1968 American Journal of Nursing issue. I was skimming through an article and there was a letter to the editor section, and I came across this letter that said, Dear editor, I have read the editorial concerning the merits of integration, if there are any. I rebuke you and the American Nurses Association for supporting the Civil Rights Act of 1963. Either you are grossly ignorant or it is your purpose to mislead your readers into thinking that this bill is in the best interest of Americans. Even now, after reading that, so many times over the last three years, I get complete goosebumps. My nervous system just sort of like goes haywire. Um, that just changed the entire trajectory of what I was studying, what I thought I was studying, what my research was going to be about. And right next to that letter was another letter by Estelle Mazzi Osborne. And I knew Estelle Mazzi Osborne's name because at my nursing school, they would have an Estelle Mazzi Osborne recognition ceremony every year. But I didn't really, I didn't, I couldn't really place or I didn't really understand who she was specifically. So I started looking her up. She was in favor of integration and talking about why the American Nurses Association and why we should be supporting the Civil Rights Act as nurses. And what I was learning was so astounding to me that she and Mabel Stoppers and the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, which started in 1908 and went through 1951, had spent their entire nursing careers working to integrate the American Nurses Association, working to integrate the U.S. Army and Navy Nurse Corps. And I couldn't... I couldn't reconcile this discrepancy, but having to read white nurses that were, in the case of this letter, threatening to like cancel their subscription. <laughs> I had a visceral reaction seeing side by side Estelle Mazzi Osborne. And for those who don't know, she was the first black nurse to have a master's degree back in the 1930s. And I just kept thinking, what more does one need to do to prove themselves to be accepted. And clearly Estelle Mazzi Osborne most likely was had higher education, higher credentials, more leadership, more advocacy than whoever was writing. It just made me realize that our collective memory of our, our actual sense of who we are as professional nurses is based on the most select British and white American centric historical milestones only and exclusively. And it's actively omitted historical facts that didn't align with our professional image. And I felt like Estelle Mazzi Osborne needs to be known. We need to talk about Lillian Wald and we need to talk about Estelle Mazzi Osborne. Like these are equal icons. And I felt like we were betraying ourselves and betraying our profession by not having knowledge and knowing the names of these complete trailblazers and pioneers that really created the profession that we have. You paint this picture so very clearly when you have this aha moment. And it sounds like it's born out of shock and a sense of this needs to be fixed that there was a very clear intention and a drive, like, okay, what can we do? So when did it occur to you, 
oh, the Nurses You Should Know project is how we're going to do this. So we, what's the, uh, the pathway from outrage and frustration and commitment to a product? It wasn't that linear. <laughs> it was, as most things are, just an email to a group of nurses. And it was almost like, hey, guys, I feel like we're getting our whole story wrong. <laughs> are you in agreement with this? Is there something I'm missing? Um, so I had different nurses chime in and I even spoke with people outside of nursing more in the historical aspect of things. And people were sending me different articles. And so I was starting to compile different pieces of evidence and just conversation after conversation after conversation, emails, emails, emails. And then a bunch of us got together and then Next thing I knew, we were building a website. And next thing I knew, we were putting a logo together. And next thing I knew, we were starting to post out stories. So we launched in Black History Month of last year. Raven, what's the origin story of your partnership, your collaboration and friendship? Wild and interesting. This is how we met. It's the middle of the pandemic. So we're virtual. So there was this app. It's called Clubhouse. And it's a social media app. It's audio only. So you can create groups and like rooms and with a topic. And then you can join the room and you can just talk to people. So you can't see them. You can't message them. It's just all audio. So there was a room on, I think it was like the history of nursing, or it may have been something about the experience of Black nurses. My roommate was like, oh, Raven, I think you might like this room. Come join it. So I join it and I'm talking. Somehow I ended up on the stage and I start telling them I'm a PhD student here at Penn and I'm studying the history of Black nurses. And there's so much that we've done. People just don't know about it, but we have done a lot. So then here comes Sandy and Sandy's like, oh my gosh, I know someone to connect you with. Her name's Joanna and she's interested in the history of nursing. I think you all should connect. So she connects Joanna and I and then the rest is history. (laughs) Uh, it's, it's, It's really great nursing history. So how do you describe the Nurses You Should Know project and how to engage with it? When Joanna and I first met, It was just a regular conversation. Like, I'm interested in the history of nursing. You're interested. What do you want to do with this? And I was just like, oh yeah, I was just going to post bios of black nurses on my social media. And I was going to make these really cool pictures of them, share photos and archives just so people can know. And then she was like, oh, nurses, you should know. We can have a blog, create the bios. That's how we can share it. And Joanna has more of the informatics side and design and social media and technology. We want it to be accessible. We wanted it to be free and we wanted it to be readable. You know, like you're on your phone scrolling. How can they get this story? Joanna expanded this a little bit more than I was expecting, but I'm like, sure, we can do it. Raven Aponte has really been my partner in crime in launching our project. And we are really working to blend how to make historical education accessible and compelling so that nurses become more curious about our true origin story. There is a design informatics ideology where you make the right thing the easy thing. And so when we were all starting to talk about this, It was already going into the second year of a pandemic. (laughs) We already had nurse educators that had decades of the way that they were teaching just gone in the course of a weekend, suddenly having to figure out how to do online learning. So we felt like going back to the adage of make the right thing, the easy thing. When you learn something in a couple minutes, sometimes that can be stickier than sitting through a two hour lecture or a 12 hour shift. So that was our goal something that really makes sense for the time and place right now. The core idea sparks my curiosity, builds a level of awareness. It's a reminder, oh yeah, there's this whole other history that I don't know anything about, that we haven't elevated, that we haven't celebrated, and that we're missing out on the learning from. And, you know, you mentioned during the pandemic that maybe people haven't had time to look at history. What you're helping us to see is that healthcare, society, nurses, we've been through pandemics before. We've been through 
workforce crises and workforce shortages. The thing that I love about what you're doing is connecting the past and the present in ways that's really highly accessible, but also really relevant and a resource to look at and say, well, this is not the first time we've ever done this. What did we do in the past to solve it and to advance forward? So what have you learned about the role of understanding our history to solve contemporary problems? Focusing my research on the history of nursing has allowed me to realize a lot of our questions, a lot of our challenges and things that we're dealing with in nursing, there's not one answer to it because it wasn't caused by one single event. These issues are complex. History allows me to see there's a lot of things interacting. There's a lot of people and institutions and ideas at play. We have to address everything at one time. You can't just say, this is my one variable. This is what we're going to do to fix this one issue. Uh, History is like, it's a little bit deeper than that. And I think it allows me to, to contextualize things. How did we come to define some of these terms or ideas? 12 hour shifts. When did that become a thing? Was it always like that? Who shaped it? Why was it shaped that way? And is it really to our benefit? I get to ask those deeper questions. Why is it important for anyone to know their history? And what gains and benefits do do they accrue by knowing what their history is, by having that be a part of their identity? There is an adage, what isn't repaired is repeated. I feel like we have lost time, we've lost generations, we've lost decades, where as a profession, we could have been walking the walk and we could have been really united and rooting for each other to succeed and being allies for each other. Instead, we've been fighting each other and trying to exclude each other. And I think that has really weakened us overall as a profession. So what are the things that have been left out that are significant and that would have made a difference and definitely make a difference today? Why is it important to know those things that have been omitted? When you look at the history of nursing, who do we know? Who's our girl? Florence Florence Nightingale. Nightingale. (laughs) Lillian Lillian Wall, Clara Barton. So they're the first names that come up. I identify as a Black woman. And eventually, you know, I became a Black nurse. I was like, wait, all these things that I learned about in the past about Black nurses and all the care work that they did, it wasn't showing up in nursing. So I knew immediately, I said, there's a disconnect here. Going through nursing, I realized people like me, we were excluded in these spaces and this idea of who is a nurse and what is nursing. So that was the first thing for me and that this idea of nursing and where it started was wrong. So you can Google Florence Nightingale, but there's also Mary Seiko. She was a Jamaican Caribbean nurse. She's literally existing alongside Florence Nightingale. So why doesn't she take the face of American nursing? And that's what I wanted to get into. As you're going through your training and your career, who are the icons that you thought of? Who, who is it that really helped you to identify, I can see myself in this? Oh my gosh, so many nurses. And this is where I knew there was an issue. So my first degree is in African-American studies and health disparities. Nursing is my second degree. Being in African-American studies, a lot of my coursework is on the history of African-Americans in the U.S. and abroad. And I remember I specifically took one course. It was called Black Women's Health. And throughout that course, we're literally focusing on Black women in healthcare, their health experiences, And then I read Sick and Tired of Being Sick and Tired, Black Women's Health Activism by Susan Smith. It's a quick read. It's like five chapters. And each chapter focuses on a different aspect of American public health and the role of Black nurses and Black organizations, even just Black health professionals. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And I'm a member of the first Black sorority. It's Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, which Estelle Macy Osborne is a member So I was like, oh my gosh, here is this nurse. And then that's where I got into the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurse. You learn about Ada B. Tomes. Then there's Mary Seacole. So when I got to nursing and it was like, Florence Nightingale, this is your nurse, the standard. I was like, no, 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 no. So I think that's what I'm trying to do now. How do I highlight 
these Florence Nightingales for me as a Black woman and share it with other people, not just Black nurses, but Hispanic nurses, Filipino nurses, Asian American nurses, Indigenous nurses. How do we get to highlight their Nightingales? Yeah. And there are so many nurses of color. Oftentimes we will phrase it as women of color, but there are nurses who aren't women. And and that's a whole other piece of the history and the story that's been left out. And I'm curious, Joanna, you come from a human-centered design approach and a background, and you've got an incredible set of skills. So using that as a lens, what was the unmet need and the problem that the Nurses You Should Know Project set out to address? We were trying to answer what if our professional origin story represented all of us. And I think in anyone that uses design thinking, when you're coming up with like a, how might we (laughs) question, how might we expand our nursing narrative? How can we expand our collective memory? Collective memory is this concept of there's what actually happened. And then there's how people remembered it (laughs) happening. Not only are we trying to narrow the representation gap, but we're actually trying to narrow the gap between what actually happened and what our collective memory is. There is a branch of design thinking called equity-centered design, and it takes pieces of design thinking and collective problem solving and being collaborative and being community-based, but a tenant of it is actually about history and healing. Where I draw from with that is that our profession, when you go through school, it represents itself as being very ahistorical. And through this project and, and through these last few years of research, it's actually completely historical. (laughs) And that's what's been such a joy about working with Raven because she has so much context and I find ways that we can take something that's heavy and then pushing it out to people's phones. It's like, we have to like level set our profession. And in some ways, I think we have a certain sense of compassion that like, you don't know what you don't know. And I didn't know a single thing about really anything outside of three years ago, stumbling upon this 1968 issue. And so we come through a lens of compassion that we want to really learn together. We are at a disadvantage because history has been omitted from our profession for so many decades that the educators don't know themselves. So we really come from a place of compassion. As we learn, we really in very much real time want this to be collective learning and have this culture of of learning together. Nursing historians, uh, the history of nurses, the study of um, nurses in history, nurses who have been left out of history. Uh, I'm just amazed, Raven, that there's this whole center of research that you're doing a PhD on all of this. So can you tell us more about the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of History of Nursing? I mean, how did you find it and what are they doing? I never thought that there was a pathway to specifically study the history of nursing. I thought I was going to have to go to a history PhD program to even get into this work. So one day after a shift, I'm like, oh, let me just Google PhD program, see what I have to do to apply. I literally just put in history of nursing PhD program and the Barbara Bates Center pops up. And I'm like, oh, wow. I see that there's this whole center located in Philadelphia dedicated to the study of the history of nursing. So there are scholars who have been doing this work for years. They have archives of materials from decades of nursing schools, nursing institutions, nursing leaders here at this specific center. They have funding. So once I look for that, I I was like, are there other schools? So there's actually two other schools that I knew of the Bajoring Center for the Historical Inquiry of Nursing at the University of Virginia, and then the University of Illinois, Chicago. There's also a History of Nursing Research Center. So there's two other of my classmates who study the history of nursing in pediatric health, immigration. So it's not just nurses of color, but we get to look at this whole correlation of the history of nursing and how have we got to where we are today. Um, So just a lot of support and room to ask those open-ended questions that take a really long time to answer. 
So now that you've been there for a, a little bit of time and you're deep into it and heavily committed, what do you think is the importance of having a center that is specifically focused on the history of nursing? And in that vein, what is the historical image of nurses and how is that a through line to today? Yeah, when you think about the image of a nurse, of course, it's a white woman who's caring, she's educated. We created that image of this nurse because when we talk about nursing, care work is so connected to this idea of who we are as nurses. What do nurses say? We care and we care through policy, economy, you know, like technology, but it's always about care. So I got into my research because I was reading a book, Body and Soul, The Black Panther Party and the Fight Against Medical Discrimination. And I learn about this nurse, her name's Marie Branch, and then her work in the Free People's Clinics throughout the 60s and 70s. So I'm like, what? When you think about the civil rights movement, you think of MLK, Malcolm X, like that's who you're taught. Either violence in Alabama, the South, protests, march, you don't hear about nurses. And I found the Barbara Bates Center, my advisor, Dr. Julie Fairman, she was also looking at nurses in the civil rights movement. So that's how I came in saying that's what I wanted to look at. I specifically wanted to learn more about nurses like Marie Branch, who were Black nurses. Like, what role did they have in the Black Panther Party and in the broader civil rights movement? Thinking about Black History Month, Black nurses, so many of the issues that we're seeing right now as far as the health disparities being laid bare. There's a very clear historical line to what we're seeing today and um, the conditions that existed during the civil rights movement. So what are some of the stories that we don't know about nurses who have been a part of barrier breaking to address segregation, segregation of care, things that created the disparities in healthcare? Jacqueline Dowd, she's a historian and she has this idea of the long civil rights movement. So when we think about the long civil rights movement or even the civil rights movement, we always think about the 60s and 70s, the Black Panther Party, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King. But it was started years before, building up to this moment. When I think about Black nurses and health disparities, these are issues that have been boiling over time, going unaddressed year after year after year. And I think the civil rights, of course, in terms of like social services and equality, it tends to blow up. But it's not like one specific thing happened in 1960 that like, oh, wow, civil rights movement, we need to make equality for all looking at organizations that Black nurses were a part of, so the National Association of Colored Graduate Nurses, you have these organizations across the nation and they're addressing these issues of how do we address Black health disparities in our communities? How do we deliver care to our communities who are excluded from the hospitals and clinics because they're Black? How do we increase opportunities for Black nurses and Black doctors to train? this long process of addressing issues. Who are some of those nurses that have been the social justice leaders in creating integration across care settings, across the disciplines, across training? Who are those names that we don't know who probably spent all of their careers working to gain access there's so many different people working in different spaces that coalesce. And, you know, when you look at the National Association of Colored Nurse Graduates and Ada Toms, this is work that started in 1908. So I just want to give space <laughs> to the listener for that to sink in following the Civil War in which Harriet Tubman served as a nurse, Sojourner Truth served as a nurse, and were not compensated by the government from the Union Army for their service. There was Susie King Taylor who fought on the Union side and wrote her own autobiography. These should be like recognized household nursing names. And there is so much of our profession and the healthcare of our nation that is intertwined with these historical periods that 
in aggregate give us the outcomes that we're seeing today. There was so much discrepancy between who deserved healthcare. That became basically the ongoing dilemma of who should have access to healthcare, whose lives mattered. And you see it in time period after time period after time period after time period, this discrepancy between what we are saying about ourselves as a nation and how we're acting. And nursing is really part of that story. And medicine is part of that story. And the healthcare industry is part of that story. And those same patterns of who deserves to be a nurse, who deserves to have a license. You know, there were nurses that were graduating and just based on the color of their skin, even though they graduated the same curriculum from accredited nursing schools, they were simply barred from taking their licensure exam. So that's our starting point. (laughs) And Um, when we say, why is our profession 80% white, 90% female? Why are there health disparities? You only have to go back a few decades and see the system is essentially working as designed. Joanna, you, you mentioned racism and racism in nursing. The 2021 National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing, and so this is the first in nursing's professional history to, to do this, and they've set out to examine the issues of racism within nursing and describe the impact to nurses and patients and communities, you know, the whole healthcare system, and really to serve as a motivation to confront racism. Um, it's this is a really big deal. So given all the work that you've been doing, what impact do you think that this is having on nursing and healthcare? I just want to publicly commend and shout out everyone that has been involved in this incredible work and it's painful work and it's hard and it's challenging work. Um, and it's so necessary. And what I, I feel like the, the gap that this commission is is closing is that it's bringing to light the lived experiences and decentering um, the white experience of nursing. For myself, I can enter into the profession. I can move fluidly throughout my career unless you're actively seeking to understand how other people are experiencing the same profession, the same hospital, the same nursing school you could miss things and you can end up contributing to a problem inadvertently. When we have national nursing organizations that are representing all nurses, what happens is because of our professional history and because of our entrenched narrative, the default centers white female interests. And so I see all of the work of this commission as really trying to expand and include all nurses truly. When you look at the authorship of all of the organizations that came together to write it, these are the words and the documents and the policies that I really think are going to hopefully profoundly affect the trajectory of of the profession going forward. The Nurses You Should Know project, what kind of an impact is it having? We've been blown away by the reaction to it. We actually have found and have been told by nurse educators that it's being used in curriculum, it's being used in assignments. And I think that really speaks to the lack of resources that exist I've looked at nursing history textbooks that have been published as recently as 2010, and there are 
entire aspects of our history that are just omitted from the book, whether it's the contributions of grand midwives, whether it's the formation of the National Black Nurses Association, the Filipino Nurses Association. There are so many groups that are just not part of the narrative as recently as this century. The thing is that what Raven and I are seeing is that the books and the authors and the scholarship exist. I think also nurses are looking to understand and really piece together how we got here. We're, we're trying to fill in those pieces. What do you see is the importance of making sure that our history is well known and how that can help us to have a better future? So much of kind of the legacy of the Victorian era was about nurses following the rules and following the orders and staying in their lane. That ethos continues to permeate the way that we educate nurses. What I have been wishing I knew <laughs> for the first 20 years of my career was nurses have been speaking up since nursing started. And by speaking up, it was not only using their voices, it was staying the course until it was changed. And if that meant ruffling feathers, and if that meant causing internal conflict in your own profession, you kept at it. And I think there is this association of subservience that we've inherited again from this Victorian image that has really not served us because there is in some ways this feeling of like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I should really. Um, it's not my place. Yeah. It's not my place to say, to speak up or to say so. Um, and it seems like the stories that you're unearthing and sharing have said, no, actually we do have a very strong tradition in history of speaking up, of being activists, of being rebels and troublemakers and change makers. Um, yeah, you can I mean, add to that list. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is this amazing nurse that we featured, Sally Tucker Allen. She was getting her doctorate degree and she realized that there was really no way for uh, their black nurses to locate each other. This was before the internet. How could they find each other and support each other? And she created the Association of Black Nurse Faculty in 1987. This is, you know, post-civil rights when everything should have been integrated. And through that, she realized that a lot of the research was not being published in the mainstream nursing journals. So she created her own publication company. And she created the Journal of Cultural Diversity, which still exists today. So I think there's this thing of you don't need permission. You don't need to wait for the committee to approve and wait five years for you to get that green light. If something isn't working, <laughs> in true nurse fashion, you go about fixing it. And what ends up happening is that you end up fixing it for the generations after you as well. So a lot of what we have uncovered as a theme in our, across all of our stories has really been this piece of social innovation, that social innovation as the process of developing and deploying effective solutions to challenge systemic social issues is embedded into who we are as a profession. When we talk about the history of nursing, we tend to think about things in the past, way back when, but that history is still alive today. When we talk about history, we're talking about things that probably happened 10, 20 years ago. So a lot of these sources are still here. There are so many nurses who haven't shared their stories and their experiences. For me, it's realizing that history is still alive today. It's not all in the past. I wanted to just loop back with you, um, Shauna, about how you're always talking about this broader umbrella theme of innovation, but this idea of how innovators are people that really see what other people are not seeing. Raven and I, we really saw something at the end of 2020 compared to where we are now 
with the initial draft publications from the Commission on Racism and Nursing. These are showing the trajectory of how you can really push the envelope. And then there is this collective momentum that you can take advantage of. And I think when we started the project um, last Black History Month, we really saw what we wanted nursing to be, what we wanted our origin story to be, what we wanted our narrative to be. And one of the things that we've been talking about internally is like, wow, we are entering a whole new space and it's only a year later. Change happens slowly and then it happens all of a sudden. And I think what you're describing is is exactly that, that you, you hit a tipping point and we've seen that with a lot of social change. And this is, this is a really important, valuable moment. And I just hope to heavens that everybody who cares about health, who cares about our workforce, who cares about equity is jumping on and adding acceleration to this. <laughs> you, you, I think you have done such a, an incredible job of laying the groundwork and the foundation, giving us the materials, the context, the tools, the understanding. And it's a tool of advocacy for us to run with. Well, I really feel like there's this um, understanding through my friendship with Raven and through this project and through the research of the systems that we've inherited. And so now that we've kind of seen what the inheritance is, when you really look at an innovative culture, then we should as a profession be able to redesign what we see is not working. Yeah, this moment where things are collapsing and needing to be re rebuilt, this is, this is the moment to do it. There's no more waiting. <laughs> And I think yeah. this moment has a group of people who are leaders and good humans who can do this. And I think you two are two of them. I am so deeply grateful for the fact that you have the commitment and the energy to lead this effort and that you didn't wait for permission. February, Black History Month. Awesome moment for us to reflect and celebrate and acknowledge and incorporate, and learn. How are you recommending, and I know that you've put together a lot of resources with the nurses you should know, how are you recommending that people spend this month and get up to speed and excited about Black nurses and their history and their contributions? On our blog, <laughs> Nurses You Should Know, we have a resource guide and there's a list of articles, books, videos that highlight the biographies and the contributions of Black nurses. So I feel like that's the number one place I would start. The next thing is interacting with the Black nurses that you know now. When we talk about Black History Month, I think we tend to highlight the first, the first Black nurse to be admitted into the school. But I think it begins by starting with yourself and how you relate to Black nurses who are working in the same environment as you, you know, who are on your social media, learn about their experiences, talk to them and see the challenges that they're going through and how you can help fix those problems. Joanna, what are your thoughts about how we should be celebrating and elevating the history? I think that with Black History Month, it's really important that we reclaim both American history and nursing history and give space to all of the Black contributors. And that is honestly something that we need to be doing year round and something that we've tried to model through our project that we use some of the momentum of the Heritage Months, but we try to really keep that recognition and that awareness going year round. I also think that there is in our Western biomedical model of nursing, there is this sense that when we train people, we are really focused on race in a way that makes people's race as the reason why their health is the way it is, instead of looking at the situation and the social determinants of health around why there are systems that have created those health outcomes. So I think it's really important 
as you're going through education, as we're reading articles, as we're reading studies, to constantly check the bias that is built into the information that we receive, allowing the month to be not about us <laughs> as white people and stepping back and really listening. Our main goal is that we hope people take away from these stories that they do have the power and the agency to speak up and be confident that they can change nursing. Even though we've been excluded, often rendered invisible, that we do have the power to change the way nursing is. Nurse Raven Aponte is the co-creator of Nurses You Should Know and a Fontaine Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing in the Barbara Bates Center for the Study of the History of Nursing, where her research focuses on the collaboration between Black nurses and community-based organizations in addressing and reducing health inequities. Raven's educational, clinical, and life experiences contributed to her research interest in the history of nursing and workforce diversity. Joanna Seltzer Uribe is the other co-creator of the Nurses You Should Know project, a nurse informaticist, a leader in design thinking education, and completing her doctorate of education in organizational change. Her forthcoming dissertation is titled White Nurses, White Spaces, and the Role of White Racial Identity in the American Nursing Profession. Nurses You Should Know is an online microlearning platform centering the contribution of nurses of color, how they've helped shape nursing, and designed to expand and course correct the nursing narrative. Nurses You Should Know meets people right where they are, which is often scrolling their favorite social media channels during the moments that best fit their learning and discovery patterns, with brief profiles of past and present nurses to collectively reframe who we think of and name as nursing icons, health innovators, barrier breakers, and legacy builders. The question Raven and Joanna set out to answer in creating Nurses You Should Know was, what if nursing's professional origin story represented all nurses? And how might having an inclusive history of the advances from every nurse impact the diversity, cohesion, and safety of our current workforce and achieve our health equity goals? The leaders in nursing, health, and social justice recognize a strong connection between a culturally diverse workforce and the ability to provide and receive care where people feel safe, seen, and valued. Unfortunately, diversifying the workforce has not gone without struggle. Black nurses, along with other nurses of color, continue to face racism and discrimination throughout their education and careers, as indicated from nurses surveyed by the National Commission to Address Racism in Nursing, where over 60% reported they have experienced an act of racism in the workplace from either a peer, a patient, or a manager. While nursing has made important strides in developing a diverse and representative workforce, there remains much more to be done. The work of the National Commission is, as Joanna characterizes, hard, challenging, urgent, and necessary to create safe and liberating environments for all. The code of ethics for nurses obligates nurses to be allies and to advocate for and speak up against racism, discrimination, and injustice. The commission also urges all nurses to join them in boldly confronting individual and systemic racism, and that nurses need to take the time to educate themselves and gain a deeper knowledge of racism's impact on the profession patients, and colleagues. As both Joanna and Raven share, Black History Month and all the Heritage Months offer an opportunity and momentum to reclaim American history and nursing history and to give space to all nursing's contributors. And that it's something that we can be doing year round and exactly what the Nurses You Should Know project models and makes readily accessible. And when it comes to celebrating a Heritage Month, as Raven suggests, History is alive and being made all around us, and that it starts with each of us learning about the nurses of color working with us, learning about their experiences, the challenges they're facing, and how you can fix those problems. Nurses You Should Know, Mary Seacole, 
Hazel Johnson Brown, Eddie Bernice Johnson, Monica McLemore, Ernest Grant, Lauren Underwood, and so many more. It's a fascinating and inspirational list. May their stories, careers, contributions, and courage symbolize the transformation we must have. And may we always know and say their names. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening. Nurses are transforming healthcare through innovation, compassion, and leadership. And Johnson & Johnson is proud to continue its 125-year commitment to champion nurses through recognition, skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association is dedicated to building a culture of innovation. Nurses improve the lives of patients and communities through innovative thinking, empathetic connection, scientific rigor, and sheer determination. ANA is proud to support and advocate for our nation's most valuable healthcare resource, our nurses. For more information on See You Now and to listen to any of the earlier episodes in our library, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.